Hello and welcome to the War Report. Now, do we have quite the news this week? Now, what I thought was going to be the biggest story of the week turned out just to be an absolute flop, so we're going to start with that one. That is some recent events happening in Syria. I'll pull up the map right now for our, uh, of course, our panel and our viewers. So, just just on Sunday, May 19th, Hayat Tir al Sham militants accused the Syrian government of using chlorine gas for a third year in a row in northern Latakia. Now, as it stands, nobody was even killed or injured by this attack. Now, keep in mind, this follows two weeks uh, of losses by Hayat Tir al Sham HTS in northern Latakia and a Russian warning of a false flag two days ago. Now, granted, the Russians can be a bit overzealous when it comes to these warnings, but according to the Russian Center for Reconciliation, captured militants revealed that HTS was set up a special unit called the Chemical Wing for this purpose. Now, the unit is reportedly headed by Abu Bashir al Britani, a member of al the Al-Qaeda link group Haras al-Din. Now, this group is a close ally of Hayat Tir al-Sham. Now, why I think this one particularly is interesting is because the media has been very slow to pick up on it. In 2017, the strikes occurred almost immediately after the so-called attacks. In 2018, there was a week-long lead-up with a massive media frenzy surrounding it. You'll recall, uh, of course, MSNBC, all these people like, oh, Assad used chemical weapons, Trump needs to get back in there, we need to take out Assad. You'll recall that, Tucker Carlson being the lone voice of resistance on that one. And now, even though the State Department accepts the HTS narrative, the media, the president, and, or even the Department of Defense have yet to make a comment on this. <laughs> well, if, it, if, if we can judge uh, the, the, this development by the last two years with uh, you know, a small number of uh, missiles flung at, uh, at Syria without much effect, that in itself uh, shows that even the country most invested with ousting Assad doesn't believe their own narrative. And this is all clearly in response to Russia's advances in Idlib. Uh, yeah. Russia's clearly just bulldozing uh, Al-Qaeda's last safe haven. And the thing is, is that this is very reminiscent to some of the old tactics we were seeing earlier in the war, where in order to get the U.S. aid, you had to either A, uh, you know, be the most successful on the battlefield, or B, you had to perform the most successful fake chemical attacks. And that's really the only way to get the, the, the U.S. Air Force to come in and save them. And so that's why this is all coming up right now, is because Russia is just pounding it lib from up above. And frankly, uh, I don't know if this is going to stick like any other uh, last some of the last few attempts that they've uh, performed in the media with these chemical attacks. This is what like the third one. Yeah, I mean, have, have you heard a year any... and a half? Just a year. Yeah, and there was the scare of one in September that they eventually didn't go through because the offensive in Idlib was delayed. But have you heard any mainstream media outlet even talking about this? I mean, like like I said, the past two years they picked up on it immediately. I haven't even heard Trump talk about this, as I was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I would agree. I mean, usually the, the whole chemical, the gassing narrative is really works well, but in the sense, it just seems like nobody cares that terrorists are getting gassed. I mean, <laughs> who, who cares, you know? The thought is actually gassing them, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> and also considering the fact that there were zero reported casualties, even injuries, and that uh, there's even no video evidence of this, I think it really falls on deaf ears this time. <laughs> I know. You'd think the White Helmet would have come up with something. But remember, Sor Soros mm -hmm. sent boats, as you said last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and actually, you know, one of the things that they're discovering in Idlib is the, the purported forces uh, prior to, like, the last two weeks and the engagements that, that have been going on was something in excess of 80,000 fighters and now they're thinking it actually might be just 8000 um uh, both these uh al-qaeda aff affiliated groups in their uh, uh retaliatory attacks i mean syria now has taken at least a dozen villages uh they're losing men sometimes upwards of 200 uh so it's not going to take too long before they exhaust their potent their uh, their resources. Uh, 
I mean, they've taken like um, several villages without even firing a shot just by saying we're coming in. You can either true. stand down or we can fight this out. And a lot of them just stand down. Right. <clears throat> right. And um, so they're not uh, nearly as effective as uh, everyone thought. That Their numbers are significantly smaller. Mm-hmm. And um, time is running out for Idlib. Uh, and uh, Soros can't stop it. So... Yeah, their hold on it live is just purely through fear. I mean, that's why they perform the public executions and such is because they're so unpopular. That's the only way you can govern. So I'm not surprised that it turns out that the numbers were so much lower than they had protect uh, they had anticipated. I saw British press publishing something about well, last week it was about oh the Russians are bombing hospitals, and uh, this week it was uh, something like fourteen people were injured because of like well, you know it's a war. Uh, no, nobody likes that, and you know let's not forget that the, the population it, it swelled because these were literally fighters and their families, like their entire. A uh, gaggle of children moving into Idlib because they still wanted to resist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and let's just not forget that they have been retaliating on Russia specifically too. I mean, the Russian bases have been experiencing rocket attacks. Yeah, I mean, they haven't been successful, but uh, they clearly recognize their adversary in this situation is more so Russia. I mean, that that is who is providing the air fire. Right. Yeah, and, yeah, and the as, other thing, I'm, go, go ahead. As um, GSP and I were saying a couple weeks back, what Russia needed in order to make it paddle with the population was a swift and clean victory because the Russian public is growing less favorable of the war, and mm-hmm. it looks like they're getting that so far. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, I think they'll be actually spurred on. Uh, so, you know, if it intensifies, I don't think it will, like, they'll lose interest. Actually, I think interest will increase because that'll hasten the end of it. I, th- I think that's what they're looking for. Um, <clears throat> Russia very badly does not want to be involved in another, like, long-term war. And uh, this war is already at, uh, well, 2015, uh, but, Almost four years, so... Yeah, just over three and a half years. Yeah. But a few other developments out of Syria is the Syrian Arab Army also uncovered several weapon caches in the course of recent combat operations in the countryside of Damascus and Dara, which, of course, keep in mind, Dara is the province that borders Israel and the controlled Golan Heights. Now... It turns out that this was revealed by the Syrian Arab News Agency. Now, some of these weapons, such as the Rod ATGMs, were stolen by the FSA from the SA ammo depots in the early years of the war. However, other weapons, such as the Conqueror's missiles, were directly supplied to Syrian militants by the U.S. and its allies. Now, the U.S. supplied these weapons, of course, as part of Obama's Operation Timber Sycamore, which was authorized in 2014 and paused officially by Trump three years later, but I I think it's interesting where they found these stockpiles near a border of a (laughs) certain country. I'm sure there's no arms smuggling operation involved with their government at all because they're the most moral country and army in the world, as as you should believe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Did, did anyone, anybody want to add anything extra to for for Syria? I mean, all I know basically right now is that, um, that you know, except for the Kurdish area, that, that it, there's a very strong likelihood that Idlib is going to collapse. Absolutely. Uh, um, and, and, and America right now is like, it's very, it's, it's stretched thin with Venezuela, the China, of course, Iran. Um, uh, what the, the, the Arctic now? Apparently, we're doing drills there. <laughs> um, the Black Sea. So y- y- we're really overstretching ourselves as it stands. Yeah. But other than that, uh, I, I mean, it, it, it's just no surprise that they uncover these stashes all the time, and it just erodes the narrative more and more to the point where, like I said, even the mainstream media doesn't really give a shit at this point. Right, and and uh, you really do get the sense that uh, the, the 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 fighters in, in Idlib, um, you know, it could have gone indefinitely. Like this could have turned into a 
um, like a, a cold situation where uh, the, the borders don't change very much, maybe like a scenario like the kind that you see in Ukraine. But that wasn't enough. Like they they thought like, well, you know, we're going to fly these like pesky drones towards uh, the Russian airstrips and in Latakia. And uh, we're going to like, I, I don't know what, win back Syria? Yeah, I, I, I don't know what, what the plan was. Like, this could have worked in 2014 when Assad's grip on Syria was admittedly fragile. Any amount of pressure that would have applied could have caused that sort of chain reaction. But at this point in May of 2019, I don't know what they were thinking or whether this was just some last ever saying, if we don't try it, nothing's going to happen, so we might as well try. But, I mean, it was probably mm -hmm. more along those lines, but... Uh, yeah, just just to, to, to bolster that point. Yeah, it's really given uh, Syria and Russia, uh, you know, all the pretext necessary to to uh, just storm into to Idlib. A, a really bad decision making here, just from an objective point of view. I mean, yeah, horrible. But um, you you ready to move on to the Iraq issue? Sure. So. What we have here is, on Sunday, May 19th, the, there was a rocket attack targeted at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. Now, this, of course, was immediately blamed on Iran and Iranian proxies in Iraq. Now, Trump was quish, quick to say on Twitter, quote, If Iran wants to fight, it will be the official end of Iran. Never threaten the United States again. And then the next day, <laughs> he comes out on May 20th and says, quote, the fake news put out a typically false statement without any knowledge that the United States was trying to set up a negotiation with Iran. This is a false report. Iran will call us if and when they are ready. In the meantime, their economy continues to collapse. Very sad for the Iranian people. <laughs> you know, that report that he saw was on Fox News. It was the, the, the rocket attack in Iraq. Now, that came out Sunday night at the same time as the Game of Thrones episode. So I think he may have been watching one or the other or switching between the two. <laughs> you know, he got yeah. false intel. And hey, this was probably really well orchestrated. Like, they knew he would be watching Game of Thrones. So if you provide him the correct intel, you know, you might get the right amplifiers, the right emotions at the right moment. And it worked. I mean, he did issue a sort of... You know, mm -hmm. the winter is coming sort of like that those previous winter is coming tweets like they got him to perform a sort of game of thrones uh level threat but in the end it's it's the same empty threats i, I mean, mean we've it, heard it, it's, threats it's peak for... boomer president honestly like just everything you just described there but you know it's pretty interesting though because that rocket attack pretty much is what propelled a lot of the of what's going on on the hill today because um, there's been a lot of action regarding that, uh, regarding whether meeting uh, to deploy troops, where, how much. All those discussions took place today, today because of that report. Now, you know, Trump is calling it fake right now, even though he believed it the night before. But regardless, it was powerful enough to spurn uh, official hearings. So what happened today was that uh, basically, there was closed door meetings uh, on Capitol Hill regarding, uh, you know, this quote unquote uh, hostile Iran and to deter Iran. And so this meeting took place uh, really early in the morning. And part of that was that um, uh, it, w it was to convince perhaps certain members of the Intelligence Committee or perhaps the Armed Forces Committee or perhaps members of the administration um, of this move. That's why it was held behind. It was behind closed doors because obviously uh, you wouldn't do that if it wasn't uh, a pot. If it was a popular issue, you wouldn't have to bring present the matter closed doors. Mm -hmm. And and we know that the matter wasn't that popular because at the ex pretty much at the exact same time that this hearing, this meeting is happening, uh, Representative Matt Gates, I forget where he's a representative from, but he just all of a sudden does this Facebook live stream, holds, holds a hearing on official America first foreign policy. Um, let me get what he's a representative of exactly. But regardless, in his speech, he basically um, states... 
uh, Trump's campaign promises of 2016, you know, non-interventionism, mm -hmm. expensive wars, protect the border type stuff. But it's weird because this is happening pretty much at the exact same time of this hearing. And he even goes as far as to call the, the, the speech he's given as the Trump doctrine. Ugh. So, so really before we go any further as to like what happened after the hearing, like what decisions they made, this is a really weird situation because on the one hand you have closed door meetings to convince certain people to perform some sort of military move. Then on the other hand, you have this guy going out there, you know, essentially <laughs> claiming to be a mouthpiece of Trump. This doctrine is T Trump's doctrine. Yeah. And right. just talking the complete opposite. Right. And we've seen this kind of contradiction uh, in, in, in Trump's administration for, ever since he took office with, with uh, you know, various geopolitical theaters. Yeah, ever ever um, since they kicked, uh, what was his name? Uh, Flynn. Flynn out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you can tell that there's a contingent that definitely wants war, but... My feeling is that the vast majority of the Pentagon does not want a, 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 a war with Iran. Mm -hmm. No, right? it's interesting. Like, he... uh, obviously, there's someone that that w w within that there is a faction that wants it. Mm -hmm. I think, but um, you know, let's not forget that um, America deployed half a million soldiers just to take over Kuwait. What is it going to take? for Iran. And let's suppose that America deploys, um, you know, 1 million, 1 million. Um, and you, keep, keep in mind our total person, our total personnel size is 1.3 million. Okay. Right. So suppose, you know, 75, 80, 90% of the forces are there to fight a war in Iran. It's not going to go fast. And that is going to be a green light for China. Yep. And uh, I, I was actually referencing this. I was doing some reading on this in on Sunday immediately after these because it sparked my curiosity. The Millennium Challenge 2002, where uh, a former Marine General Paul von Ripper commanding a fictitious Iranian military force managed to sink entire carrier group in 10 minutes. Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so um, the other thing, too, is like, even though these are the sort of numbers that we think would take uh, to defeat Iran or what have you, the thing is that at the end of this closed door meeting, there was a report that came out that they're pretty much thinking about deploying 5,000 troops to the Middle East to deter Iran. So, I saw 10,000. Even though, you know, you would think that there was this number, uh, like a, a million people, 120,000 soldiers, what have you. At the end of the closed door meeting, pretty much all they came up with was 5,000 more troops to be sent to the Middle East. Now, obviously, this is just ridiculous. This is like drops yeah. in the bucket. This is why are we even reporting this, you know? You're basically yeah. just moving, uh, you know, you know, pawns around. So essentially, it's not you're not actually increasing anything to the level of a threat. Yet this is still being presented and reported as such. And no, so I, I'm curious, did that report include like any hardware movements such as tanks, maybe anti-aircraft system, uh, missile systems, or just five thousand troops? Mm, let me see. I believe it was just five thousand additional troops. It was a Reuters report that. Uh, I guess here Pentagon is considering a request. Now the request to send 5,000 troops comes from this closed door meeting. Now, of course um, it does. <laughs> so Matt Gates, just real quickly, he's a representative in Florida. He's a Republican too. So he may be trying to take Trump's doctrine from himself, but I don't think as a Republican, he would go out there at the same time as mm -hmm. this hearing against trump like being like oh i'm more trump than trump you know it that that's not smart it doesn't make sense he's not really campaigning right now it's too early what do you think so, it was do you think it was a uh, do you think he panicked do, 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 do you do you think he overreacted well i so first of all i haven't heard that trump was actually in this hearing so this mm -hmm. hearing did consist of Mike Pompeo, the new Secretary of Defense, Patrick Shanahan, 
uh, members of Pentagon, and Bolton, then some, I assume. Uh, and um, Satan was there too. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> kidding. But my point being is that it doesn't Shit, sound like Satan's here. <laughs> you already said Pompeo. You don't know. Sounds no like sulfur. <laughs> oh. But yeah, it's like what, what was that joke that the Venezuelan president made once that the podium smelled like sulfur after George Bush left? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> but it, it sounds like Trump wasn't there, and so yeah. because he wasn't there, and these discussions were being had, my my theory is that he may have asked Matt Gates to go do this on his behalf. Well, Wow. Yeah. And and I I think there's it's re- possible. there's re- it, it it coincides with the sort of like schizophrenic back and forth we've been getting that Trump even tweeted out like oh well you know even though we've been going back and forth at least Iran doesn't know what we're going to do but like in reality I think that that is sort of a, a a projection in the sense that it is an admission that there is this sort of flip-flopping going on but it's not because to trick iran it's because there's an actual debate going on right everybody can see that there's uh there's incoherence it's not because they have they're not going to reveal their hand yeah yeah they're they're not doing they're not doing some kind of kissinger madman strategy it's honestly that they don't have a coherent policy because there's so much internal fighting yeah absolutely and the fact that they even you know, at the end of it, it sounds like the report is only 5,000 troops. It sounds like it's almost like, you know, like, okay. Yeah, you know, like, we fine. Like, oh, you, you wanted 20,000? Okay, take five. That's all you're getting. Yeah, so it sounds like they didn't get what they wanted, obviously. But at the same time, it's like, <laughs> this is, like, laughable. What message does it send to Iran? You know, it's like they're not – 5,000 troops doesn't mean anything, you know? Oh, so, yeah. Going back to like, you know, if they're going to blame Iran for the rocket attack that, uh, you know, spurned this whole discussion, 5,000 troops is nothing. And another interesting point I saw just on this whole thing, apparently in terms of deterring Iran, that wing of B-52 bombers we deployed to, um, not Kuwait, Qatar, it, there's actually a bit of an issue there because it's uh, there's reports going around that the Qataris might not give them clearance to launch because of the growing relationship between Qatar and Iran, the fact that they might not th- let them leave El Uaid, I believe the air base is. So uh, we may have just rendered that pointless. Right. And uh, there's, there really, uh, it doesn't look like there's any support in Europe, too. Uh, let's not forget there were two opposite. incidences that took p- yeah, uh, for instance, um, just shifting a little bit, but it relates to Iran. Uh, both um, dock worker unions in France and Italy protested against ships that were ostensibly coming to Italy and France to re- you know, receive uh, weapons for the war in Yemen. And uh, so I-, I think politicians are aware that the, that uh, there's you know zero there will be zero support for this war. Um, and it's just logistically not not possible. America would literally have to resort to like precision nukes or small nukes uh, in, in order to to you know to do this. If anything, this has spurred Iran to definitely probably <laughs> uh, start its nuclear enrichment program for missiles. Uh, whether America's threat was was really legitimate or not. It's it's out there, and um, it's all the pretext that Ar- Iran needs to do that. Absolutely. Now, I did want to move on a bit. I did mention Trump saying, oh, the Iranians can call us. So Rouhani pretty much shot down any hopes and negotiations and said that <laughs> Iran would not bow under pressure. But interestingly enough, Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif had a bit of a more open approach. He actually had an interesting tweet on Monday. He said, quote, at real Donald Trump, rightly deploy, deplores the military-industrial complex trying to push the U.S. into forever wars. But he's allowing the B-team to trash diplomacy and abet war crimes by milking despotic butchers via massive arms sales and achieve nothing but empowering the same complex. Is it time to drain the swamp? So, 
pretty much he took Trump's rhetoric from the campaign and said, well, d don't you remember this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah. Um, like I say, uh, the, the, the war would be monstrous. Uh, let's not forget those other countries around there with significant Shia populations like Bahrain, uh, even smaller numbers uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, Iraq. And Iraq actually said that the president came I mean, out and said, I don't want my country to be a battlefield for a U.S.-Iran war. Right. And so um, and Iran is a very large country and it's quite mountainous. So um, I think, like I say, I think I think the majority of the military is against this, and uh, I think there's just a few hotheads. Um, ultimately, I think what they want, ultimately, I think what they hope to achieve is regime change. And the supposition is based that, you know, if, say, I don't know, Portugal or uh, uh, Romania or Italy or Spain was going through uh, a, a situation like the kind that Iran is in. It's just a matter of time before they force elections and there's going to be regime change. Well, I mean, that hasn't happened. Um, it is a different civilization. Uh, the, the, you know, they have their own logos. It's not like Europe's. It's different. Uh, so that's not working. And I think, you know, I think that's the major thing is that they cannot get the regime change that they've wanted for decades. Yeah. And that's in contrast to the point where under Obama, under his administration with, with the Iran deal, pretty much what it was is what Obama's goal was, was the soft conquest of Iran, turning them pretty much into a U.S. client state, pretty much intertwining the U.S. Iranian economies. And uh, right. all for the global like containment strategy of Russia that Brzezinski envisioned. I mean, of course, Brzezinski was part of making this deal. So it, it didn't because you had the more left wing nor neoliberal perspective, whereas you have the more neoconservative perspective where they say, let's go in, uh, bomb, bomb, bomb Iran, as John McCain, the late John McCain would say. And it, it's interesting <laughs> because by Obama trying to do the first and then Trump backing out of it, they pretty much invalidated any chance – especially with the passage of time and the changing situation in the region, they pretty much made the second right. option possible. Right. They they've com they completely underestimate the power of global homo, which, which uh, Obama knew very well. So, mm -hmm. But yeah, so today, ultimately, uh, the Ayatollah did respond to all of Trump's threats from this week. And... <laughs> Uh, he ultimately issued his, you know, boomer tier level threat as well. And his threat was that the Iranian youth will eventually see the demise of Zionism and U.S. foreign policy. So, you know, the this back and forth is funny. It, it's kind of fun in the sense that it's not going anywhere. It's reminiscent of North time, Korea two years ago. Mm. Yeah, it's just like what are we doing now? You know, why are we still using the same talking points, the same, uh, you know, points of concern? If there's not going to be any movement, then, you know, we shouldn't be making any threats, but we shouldn't be making any, you know, moves to negotiate either, you know? What, right. So the, the problem is that by keeping this discussion, every year we have to go through this little Iran bump. And, you know, this bump is, I'll admit, is a little bit longer than the, the previous two years under Trump. But ultimately, you know, it's you, Trump is damned if he does and damned if he, he doesn't. In the sense yeah. that if he acts on Iran, it'll energize the left uh, into some anti-war thing or what have you. Um, or if he doesn't do anything, you know, his uh, competitors will try to paint him as weak. Yeah, and, and of course, John Bolton, Mike Pompeo, will have his ear for the entire day and just complain, rant, and rave about how he must do something about Iran. So he has people within his own camp that will turn on him if he doesn't do anything about Iran. Mm -hmm. And because this border, there's nothing happening with the border, the odds of, you know, the GOP might be making the calculation that the odds of Trump winning on his platform might be slimmer than 
uh, just a traditional GOP. -er. So you have someone like Marco Rubio, who was a com previous competitor of Trump, right now being the most vocal person for uh, a conflict and confrontation with Iran. Actually, so, I think I think you just gave me a wonderful idea for uh, the, Trump's election strategy. So here's what we need to do. We need to claim that the IRGC is operating in Mexico. We'll have a wall tomorrow. <laughs> you know, they still wouldn't let you do that. <laughs> but because, I mean, here's the thing, too, with Marco, is that he actually is trying to sniff for some blood. I mean, Trump humiliated him in 2015. In 2016, I mean, it's remar remarkable that he's been able to retain um, such prominent. He, I mean, he's been able to win back Trump, honestly, but mm -hmm. he sort of mm -hmm. salvaged his career a little later on. But as soon as Trump came in, you know, he was part of that never Trumper crowd that, you know, we probably were predicting we weren't going to be seeing much longer. But at the same time, you know, it looks like. Uh, Trump is in the sort of Jimmy Carter situation where, you know, he is screwed no matter what he does and his opponents are sniff they're looking for blood and these are including internal opponents. And so good. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it's interesting that you bring up Carter because it reminds me of Carter, uh, you know, after Ford was basically the presiding president after America's long ten-year war in in Vietnam, and in a way, um, I mean that wasn't, uh, you know, it on first blush it was not a successful war. You know, it was a defeat. Uh, w one could argue that Vietnam is now definitely within. Uh, the American sphere of influence and so on. I mean, they don't even use Chinese characters anymore, so on and so forth. Uh, however, uh, something like that, I think, has also happened with the war in Iraq and um, the, the appetite for another major conflict stretching out for years and years with heavy casualties. Uh, you know, it is a diminishing return. And... Uh, so we're seeing, you know, Trump is in a, in a I think, in a, in an analogous uh, situation. To, uh, I would especially uh, say so when you, can, when you consider. Uh, also, you want to add even another parallel that the current situation in the Middle East has not been friendly to energy prices. So, I mean, of course, Carter didn't have the advantage of a booming domestic uh, energy industry. Right. But I mean, think things could go things could go to hell tomorrow in terms of gas prices, and it would not reflect. Uh, not a war, Trump. absolutely, and a war with Iran would do just that. And the and the country that would gain the most would be Russia. Barrels over a hundred dollars, maybe one hundred twenty-five, maybe one hundred forty. Who knows? That would be a boon to them. Uh, it would be it would be a disaster for 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 the West, anyways. So. Yeah, I mean, good luck exporting, and I mean, the Saudis couldn't export their oil in the middle of a U.S.-Iranian conflict. They'd need to go through Hormuz, and even you try to go through the Red Sea, the, the Iranians have a presence there. And so, yeah, the, the Russians, interestingly enough, they would be, as you said, the biggest winner out of all of this. But um, I do want to move on to the European Union elections, because... Just real some... quickly, just real go quickly. Ahead, go ahead, go so... ahead. Right now, antiwar.com is saying that the Pentagon plans to send troops is not 5,000, but 10,000 Yeah, I saw that earlier, too. So, that's weird, because Reuters is reporting 5,000. So that's, um, uh, again, just some more, just more obfuscation, more obscurity <laughs> just coming from the administration. That's like, one, it makes sense in the time of war, but this that's not what's going on here. That's not I, what's going on here. Yeah, I, I, and you know what? I think five, ten thousand. I think Iran is is aware right now that Trump wants them to ask for for a meeting to, for negotiations. I think they're very well aware that that's for Trump to save face, and, and I don't think Iran is going to give it to them. You know that too, and I wonder, like, if Iran actually did call. Would Bolton and Pompeo even let Trump answer the phone? <laughs> right? Because if Trump I'm answers the phone... I'm picturing what that would look like. 
Oh, yeah, hello, is Donald just... there? Um, no, he's out. He's he's out golfing. He's at Mar-a-Lago. Call back later. Block that number. Block block that fucking number right now. <laughs> <laughs> What's the reality of the situation? Because if they do strike, if they if Iran somehow convinces Trump to re-enter the JCPOA or what have you, that pretty much just puts a major wrench into Bolton and his you know his financiers' uh, plans. Because they want more, they don't want the, to re-enter the JCPOA. Uh, people in Adelson's camp thought that the the Ron deal was one of the worst things ever. I mean, this is where Trump got this. I mean, Trump before he became a candidate, he didn't know what the JCPOA was. Yeah, yeah, he just knew. Oh, Obama did it, so it must be bad. That's the point they sold on him. But and if, if Trump did come crawling back to it, it would look bad for him just politically on a domestic and global level. It would look mm-hmm. oh, look at this guy. He's so weak. We could just browbeat him back into any agreement we want to. Who says we won't browbeat him back into what? What is it? NAFTA or any of these other agreements or the TPP? And you know what? The worst part of this is now because Trump can't re-enter the JCPOA because he's going to look weak. Uh, and he knows that his the Democrat rivals are going to campaign on that issue, that he, he messed up the Iran deal. So what he's going to do, and I, I, this is why I think he's the next round of sanctions is targeting the metals in Iran, the metal industry. It's because I think he's going to actually try to sabotage the deal so that even if a, he gets – he's voted out and a Democratic president comes in, they won't be able to salvage the deal. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, put, so, that, so then this way, the Dem- once the Democrats realize that Trump has sabotaged the deal, they can't really campaign on, oh, we're going to bring back the Iran deal. Now – I, I I do want to get into some European election stuff before we go yeah, on too long. So, of course, the European uh, Parliament elections will begin tomorrow for us in the studio, today for those of you in the audience, and will continue through Sunday, May 26th. Now, projections show big wins, but not a majority for populist coalitions such as the ENF and ECR. And I'll pull up the current EU elects projections right now. That's what they expect the layout of the Parliament to be by the end of the elections. So uh, you have, of course, the biggest coalition is still the ruling um, EPP, which is the light blue right here. But you're, you're seeing that these populist coalitions over here on the right and the dark blue and the gray, that they're growing. Now, I also saw some interesting, again, these are all from Europe Alex. They're a great. You should check them out. If you don't follow them, you should. And these are the projections for who has the biggest gains and who has the biggest losses. So if the EU elections were held today... The largest gained seats would be from the Brexit party in the UK with plus 28, Lega in Italy with plus 20, um, the uh, pretty much the establishment party in France plus 13, the Liberal Democrats in the UK with plus 8, um, the Nationalist Conservative Party in Italy with plus 6, and Vox in Spain, the more populist party, with plus 6. Now, the biggest losses would be UKIP with minus 24, mainly because Brexit party stole a lot of their thunder. The Social Democrats in Italy with minus 15, the Conservatives in the UK with minus 12, the Social Democrats in Germany with minus 11, the Forza Italia, which is the establishment right-wing Italian party with minus 9, and the Social Democrats in France with minus 8. So you're seeing a lot of these establishment parties really shed their, not shed their skin, but pretty much die off in favor of these up-and-coming populistic parties as the election draws closer, because as we're sitting right here one day out, as those in the audience will be watching, it'll be the day of the start of the election cycle. Right. And I think if you forecast for the next 10 years for Europe, I don't think populist parties are going to go down in popularity. I think they're going to increase. And primarily, I think the reason for this will be because, one, um, European companies... Are, are going to find it more difficult to, say, push eastward or push abroad for, uh, for you know, of course, financial gain and influence and so on. And um, the younger generation, which uh, this pressure, you know, there's a diminishing amount and it's being, you know, replaced with people that don't seem to be interested in uh, other than handouts, uh, in, in in restoring some kind of glory to uh, to Europe 
or some kind of at least maintaining the hegemony. Uh, that frustration, I think, is only going to increase. And you can see where uh, America has a significant influence uh, uh, in terms of sanctions against Russia. Now, you know, Nord Stream 2 is an exception, but there's countries that are against it, uh, like France, for instance. Um, we're going to see, I think, even more clampdowns. Uh, Macron just issued um, uh, a statement that... Uh, the journalist responsible for disclosing, for leaking the information that France was supplying the Saudis with weapons for 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 the war in Yemen um, could face five five years in prison, or eighty three thousand dollars, or both. Wow. Now, so it's interesting that you bring that up. You might want to hold on to that because that's actually what I'm bringing up after the Brexit issue in Theresa May, but that, that's pretty good um, stuff to get get into that. But I want to cover this real quick because the Brexit stuff is pretty yep. short. So political turmoil in the UK is no surprise at an all-time high right before the EU elections, elections that they shouldn't even be having because they should be out of the European Union already. Now, Nigel Farage's new Brexit party, as we were just discussing, has really stolen the thunder from UKIP. Now, as it stands, the Brexit party is at 35% in the polls, with Labour in second at 18%. Now, there's been rumors flying around that Theresa May's resignation is imminent. I saw one saying that it would happen tonight. I saw some saying it would happen by the end of the week. But point being is, it looks like she's been on the rocks before, but this time I would say she's really on the rocks. Now, although there's been no confirmation of any resignation from May, the leader of the House of Commons, Andrea Leadsom, so it's pretty much our equivalent of the Speaker of the House, keep that in mind, has resigned. Now, as it stands, Theresa May won't even have a leader in the House to bring forward a withdrawal agreement bill in regards to Brexit, so she's pretty much lost all political influence in the House because there's nobody to even propose bills left. Yeah, I think she's on her last leg as well. Um, I, I, I don't know what more I could add to that. Um, uh, I think from, from what I saw from like some tweets today in, on, on Twitter, uh, I, th I think her leaving, her stepping aside is, is going to be interesting because it's going to probably create even more turmoil. Um, uh, of course, there's the talk of this, uh, of having another referendum on Brexit, which I think was always in the works anyways. Uh, but I think, honestly, I, I think there's probably as much or more support for Brexit now. I could be wrong, but that's well, I, what it I would looks say. Like I would say with Farage's poll numbers, there is uh, now. Yeah. Building on what you were saying before we got into the Brexit issues, now just a little over five years after the Crimea crisis, more and more European nations are beginning to thaw relations with Russia. Now, the main ones that come to mind are populist strongholds such as Hungary and Italy, but even countries like Germany are moving towards Russia with, as you were mentioning, Nord Stream 2. Now, in response to Nord Stream 2, U.S. Energy Secretary Rick Perry said that a sanctions bill will target companies involved. He said, quote, the Senate is going to pass a bill, the House is going to approve it, and it's going to go to the President, and he's going to sign it, and we're going to put sanctions on Nord Stream 2. So, a lot of cockiness from Rick Perry. He, of course, was in Kiev for the inauguration of Zelensky, which we'll, we will be getting into in a minute. But in terms of European countries turning back to Russia, Matteo Salvini has made it a improving relations with Russia and lifting sanctions a key part of Lega's election campaign for the EU elections. He said, quote, I continue to believe that we don't need sanctions. The issue of the removal unites all decent people. Now, it's also projected with the elections coming up that the ENF will be either the third largest or second largest bloc in the European Parliament. Now, a common theme throughout all of this is that Washington wants to issue imperial decrees to Europe while at the same time trying to shirk its imperial responsibility to them. Now, th we've already seen this, especially <laughs> with uh, Italy, especially with Hungary, especially with, you know, even to a degree with Poland, that there's a rift growing between Europe and the U.S. Even if it isn't that evident now, Throughout the 2020s, it will grow exponentially. Right. And I think by the 2020s, you're going to see either some Eastern European or what they call Central European, but I consider them Eastern European. Like I, I basically consider Austria and Russia, uh, sorry, Austria and Germany and uh, Switzerland to be basically Central or. Yeah, I, th I think it's a fair assessment. Yeah. I mean, I mean. You, you could say the same thing about, you know, the Arab world. Well, you know, the Arab world stretches to Morocco. Um, 
it, so I don't, uh, you know, anyhow, I don't want to get off topic, but uh, 2020s, uh, I would I would say that either you're going to have a few Eastern European countries actually not be part of the EU anymore, or for those who stay, they will uh, have uh, a second class status. And that includes Southern European countries. Yeah, pretty much everyone, I mean, and as Germany shifts, as the support for um, the ADF grows, even as Merkel is willing to make some tepid and even go through the Nord Stream 2 with Russia, you know, even just on the economic level, you're going to see pretty much everyone except the UK, France, and maybe the Scandinavian countries be uh, more open towards Russia. I'm not necessarily saying even alliance or even like overtly friendly, but on decent terms, at the very least. I have a feeling the whole anti-Russia sentiment will only really last, again, in the British Isles and in Scandinavia and France. And I'd say that's the limit to it, because just for pragmatic reasons, a lot of these Southern European countries, Eastern European countries, and Central European countries are going to just cut basic economic deals with Russia, or at the very least, just lift sanctions. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, Eastern Europe and Southern Europe are, are uh, I think, the, the most willing partners to reconcile with Russia. I mean, you've had, they've been steamrolled economically by the European Union. They've done them no favors. And then they have the, the audacity to chastise them when they turn to, quote-unquote, radical parties in response to that. Of course they're going to go towards Moscow. You've made it look much more appealing than Brussels. Congratulations. You've done what would have been impossible 30 years ago. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Now, that's pretty much all I have to say for the European Union elections, unless either of you two have any comments on the subject. Oh uh, no, I'm 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 good. Um, so I'll move on to the news in Austria because that was actually a bit of an interesting development. So there's been a massive shakeup in the Austrian government. I would go as far as to even call it a coup orchestrated by Brussels. So President Alexander Van der Bellen, who is of the Green Party, has fired Interior Minister uh, Herbert Kixel, who's part of the FPO, which is the populist right-wing party, at the request of Chancellor Sebastian Kurz, who is of a center-right party. Now, this prompted other populist right-wing members of the FPO in the cabinet to resign, shattering the coalition government formed in late 2017. Now, it's projected that there will be another election in September because the current ruling party, the current center-right party, could not find another coalition partner. Now, Kickel was booted from the government because of a, quote, corruption scandal, with the FPO apparently offering government contract in exchange for electoral support, and of course... Uh, they find a way to tie this back to Russia. Apparently he met somebody connected with a Russian oligarch, as they always do with these kind of things, especially as Austrian-Russian relations improve. Now, the reason I believe this is orchestrated in Brussels and or Washington is because Kurz is 32 years old, inexperienced, and part of a ruling coalition. It's, it seems like it'd be very easy to fracture. It's not somewhere like in Italy where you have two populist parties ruling in a coalition. It's that you have an establishment party and a populist party ruling in a coalition, and it, led by an inexperienced young man, who that coalition is going to be easy to break if you apply some pressure, especially it, when you're part of an international organization such as the European Union. Right. Uh, I don't understand. Like, I mean, okay, so uh, they, they, they break... Uh, a right-wing or center uh, coalition uh, in Austria. Oh, okay, so, I mean, how how pivotal is Austria to to all this? Not very. Yeah, it's not like it's not like they look. I'm not saying Hungary is that significant in terms of its influence, but in terms of Orban as a figure, I would say if they took him out, that would be significant. In terms of Italy, both with Salvini as a figure and the Italian economic and their geopolitical standing, that would be significant. But they targeted what is ultimately the weakest link beyond something like a, what, a Romania? Right. R right. I mean, the, the right-wing populist in, movement in, in Austria is not really like at the level that it is in, say, Poland or Hungary or Italy uh, or Spain. So it's not like I mean it. Uh, it was low hanging fruit. Let's just say that. Yeah, the weakest link, and it was just easy for them to pluck off. And of course, propaganda outlets such as the Atlantic made this, of course, about the Russia, as I was discussing, and they used this as <laughs> a, a way to browbeat the entirety of European populists. Now, 
I think in their arrogance, they will try this in Italy next because they're also ruling with the coalition government. But if I had to say if they're going to try it in Italy next, it is going to backfire massively because of Salvini's... I mean, what what's his popularity at now? Do do you have any current numbers on that? I think it's I, 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 I think it's know. I think it's like somewhere in the sixties. I know he's not as high as Orban, but a point being is his popularity rating is pretty high, and you want to make it higher, you take some attempt against him. Like I'm saying, that's orchestrated in Brussels, which all these things are. Let's not kid ourselves here. Right. Well, you know, it'll be interesting to see what kind of language they use. I say this because. Uh, this video uh, of uh, from Austria, of course, uh, is actually two years old. So they've they have been sitting on this video for quite some time. Um, of course, the the press is completely complicit in this because the, the 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 press is they're basically activists for global homo. So. I mean, uh, I mean, the, I I cited the Atlantic for a specific reason because they're connected to the Atlantic Council. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, the other ones, I mean, that's one of the more overt ones. There's other ones with much, I would say, quieter ties, but I chose the most overt one for obvious reasons. Yeah. Now, did you guys see the pictures of Salvini at the beach taking shots with a bunch of Italians? Did you see that? Uh, I haven't seen it yet. I, 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 saw, mean, I, saw, I saw the him. one of him in the crowd where he was going to a rally, uh, contrasted with Macron in his like body armor. But that I didn't I didn't see the one you're talking about. But I've, 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 yeah, I've seen pictures from this general. Um, I would say media blitz that Salvini's been going on. Yes. Yeah, this was just this last weekend. Looks like he's just quite the partier, relaxed. He looks like yeah. a commoner. It's really <laughs> cool though when you see that. that. It, it reminded me of those videos that the Syrian government would came out with when Assad would walk around the market and people would just go like say what's up to him and he'd just be like smelling apples or whatever <laughs> well, I mean, no, or, or driving in his car is, is, is very you know I, I just love that yeah yeah but i love that picture of salvini if i can find it i'll send it to you and we can put it up real quick but, but oh, yeah i mean you just have this who he's a, quite in the true sense a man of the people someone who was like your average italian just there interacting with them and having a positive experience, and I would say this is a big part of his popularity. I'm not saying it's not uh, his policies have nothing to do with it, but I'm saying his personality is a big part of that. I mean, because you have someone like Giuseppe Conte, the current prime minister, pretty much in line on almost everything in terms of ide- ideology and platform. But there's the reason why <laughs> okay, Salvini is the face of the I'm sending you this government. picture right now. Yeah, I'll, I'm I'll, sending I'll, you the most badass picture right uh, now. Uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll get that. So. Um, just sending it via Twitter. But I, I agree with you, uh, Constantine. It, it um, he he does he does project that. I, I'm, I'm sure it's sincere too, that he's a he he is a man of the people. Uh, they they respond to him so positively. So, uh, so let, me, let me just pull up this uh, this photo. So, if either of you have any more comments on that situation, I I'll you can. No, no, I'm good. Uh, yeah, of course, Twitter is t- taking forever to load. Just one of those things. If I if I can't get it up, I, I mean, oh, oh well. But uh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll post on Twitter. You'll be able to see it after the show. Don't worry. Calm down. <laughs> but I do want to move on. Just the last couple of topics we have here is um, Z- Zelensky. I want to discuss our good friend Zelensky's inauguration. So, of course, Vladimir Zelensky, the now president of Ukraine, the comedian who beat up Poroshenko by a 74% margin, has done a pretty radical move, not something I honestly would have expected. He he dissolved the parliament just moments after his inauguration. Now, he did this because the current parliament wouldn't support a bill to stop, quote, illegal enrichment, and he also wanted a motion to fire the defense minister, the head of security, and the head uh, and the prosecutor general, all of whom were appointed by Poroshenko, of course. Now, Zelensky also urged current cabinet ministers to resign. So far, Defense Minister Stefan Poltorak has resigned via a Facebook post. So, there's that. As of now, Zelensky has done exactly the opposite of what Washington and Brussels wanted him to do. Yeah, because uh, if, if, if Poroshenko got one thing right, it was his militarism. On, on behalf of NATO, uh, that was the one thing that, uh, generally speaking, uh, NATO and America supported him on. 
uh, for Zelensky to shake things up like this. Uh, who knows uh, what, what what's ahead? I, yeah, I, I would definitely agree. And he's, he's treading in the dangerous waters, and he's doing honestly what I hoped he would do, which was just sow chaos in Ukraine, which would allow pretty much Russia to assert their influence over it more so because I honestly let, let's just be up front here I think that's probably the best fate Ukraine could have right now right um, you know there has to be some kind of reset or or the only other option is a is a frozen war that lasts another you know a decade longer or uh, the country splits Um but I think you know it's going to take some time for them, because of course the the the, the problem is is uh, if Zelensky goes too far, uh, th- you know those nationalist groups in in Ukraine uh, will now claim that of course Putin controls Zelensky, and that they've been had. That that's just a, a such a common narrative now. Yeah, especially in the West, and it, it'd be very easy to exploit to. Ukraine at the at the very least, and uh, of course the, the Brussels and Washington would have their fingerprints all over any sort of accident or scandal connected to Zelensky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's going to be uh, something very interesting to watch, especially as you know Nord Stream uh, last week uh, uh, is now half completed, so. Or it's half completed this week. Anyhow, it's it's steamrolling. It's and uh, of course that will mean that Ukraine, unless uh, it works out um, some of its differences with Russia, will literally have to buy. It's already buying from other European countries, but we'll have to buy directly from Germany. Yeah, which, and it, 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 it's fine. Yeah, Germany buys from Russia. Ukraine buys from Germany at the end of the day, it's just a big loop around. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but just to close close out the stream, with the Australian election, which happened on Saturday, so I'll pull up the percentage chart and the electoral map. So, on Saturday, May 18th, the Australian government held the general election that the current ruling Liberal National Coalition won in an upset. Now, they ruled before, of course, you had some resignations, you had some scandals, and pretty much for the, a year before the entire election, people were predicting, oh, Labor's going to win. Oh, some left-wing coalition's going to win. And out of nowhere, the conservatives pulled it off. Mm. Now, I do have to say, I, I call them conservatives for the sake of convenience, but their party is called the Liberal Party, but that's their right-wing party, which I would say, especially for the Anglosphere, is very fitting, considering the fact most Anglosphere right wing parties are just neoliberals, so I, they're just three, yeah. they're three letters short of being entirely honest with the voters. Now, <laughs> I thought the reaction to this was funny because, for some reason, of course, celebrities, blue check marks, they all need to get involved and give their woke take on the elections. That you had American Canadian celebrities complaining about how some racist government just won in Australia. And I would say, honestly, out of all the Anglosphere countries, Australia probably has. Uh, the the best the best hand when it comes to the the very tumultuous mm-hmm. future we're looking forward to not only demographically just just geographically I would say in pretty much every aspect but uh, it it was it's kind of hard to be excited about this win because at the end of the day I, I they literally call themselves the liberal party <laughs> well I mean at least it's, they're honest um, but yeah you know uh, Australia I th- still has that kind of um, healthy amount of um, well I mean conservatism for lack of a better word um, I, I th- and I think it's it's going to it's actually going to grow because uh, th- there's a kind of like uh, when, when people talk about you know the far right or the you know the, the populist movements and so on and so on um, a lot of this is also has to do with like the perception of a previous order passing away in an era, an uncertain era coming, and uh, an era whose hegemony will be markedly different. 
And uh, so, you, you know, th there's a kind of natural shift that is happening. Also, uh, I, I think people are quiet about it. Uh, and, and actually, this proved to be the case in Australia as well, prior to the election, that people were not disclosing honestly who they would vote for. And they, of course, they didn't expect that the natural, sorry, the, the, the liberal national coalition to, uh, would win. So um, I think, you know, culturally, it, uh, in the Anglosphere, in the West, it, you know, uh, on a yearly basis, it seems to be getting more and more insane. And, 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 yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and so now it's very powerful, of course, because it's, it, it it comes it's top down it, it comes from the institutions themselves uh everything from uh or, or estates you could say the the media the news but also the institutions like academia and government and so on um so people are uh, are reserved about it they're not they're not going to necessarily state who they're going to vote for and then there's this shock in a way i think this is great because um it certainly keeps elites guessing uh, and not this this really is a way of not showing their hand right yes uh I, yeah i mean i even remember uh in my 20s reading baudrillard and him talking about the the silent masses and and how he well he predicted uh, similar situations like this so it's it's interesting that you know decades later i'm i'm, I'm seeing some fruits of this happening now People have compared this and said it's the Australian break. It's the Australian version of Trump winning. Now, I would say that's true in the sense of, yeah, they aren't showing their hand and that this was a big upset that came out of nowhere because people were hiding their honest intentions. But I also would say in the sense that it probably is going to be a great disappointment a year or two down the road. So, uh, we unfortunately, we have to look at it from both perspectives. But that's, yeah, pretty, that's, that's, that's all I have to say about the Australian election is pretty much all I have to say in general. So unless either you two have any closing thoughts, I think I'm going to wind the show down to a close. Sure. But this has been the War Report. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, I, I know I had a bit um, bit of some hiccups with uh, some map stuff and uh, some stuff. My, my dogs, uh, they, they decided to act up now. I mean, you know, I, I give them all day, and if they, 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 they choose this. Now, uh, it's not that big of a deal. No, we, we got them taken <laughs> care of. But uh, thank you all for tuning in, and goodbye. Thanks, guys. Thank you.